Does the color of the sky mean anything special to you? It does to me. A hell of a lot. When I close my eyes, the sky in my dreams is a deep, dark blue. Pilots have been in my family for four generations. Flying's in my DNA. Even so, my grandpa didn't want me joining the Air Force. He lost faith in the Ocean Air Defense the day my dad died in battle. You know, Abby, I wish you could see what it's like up there. Cruising above the clouds, the dark blue of the stratosphere. Nothing beats being at the controls and seeing it from the cockpit. Look here. Gramps tossed a magazine over to me with an article. Unmanned fighters are no longer a dream, it read. Pilots taking to the skies will soon be a distant memory. I don't see anything good coming from that. Know what? Lying smack dab in the middle of the desert west of here, there's a bunch of planes from the last war. Some of them have been mothballed, but most of them are just rusted piles of junk waiting to be scrapped. Gramps was really good friends with the super there, so he got to take whatever he wanted, no questions asked. That's how we got the parts to build our own plane. Now, when I say we, I mean me, my grandpa, and his old war buddies. I cut my teeth working with those geezers. They taught me their skills and some dirty jokes. But with their aging eyeballs and whatnot, I ended up having to do most of the work myself. I was at the airstrip doing some flight training when I saw it. A prototype drone. It wasn't much of a plane, more of a trash can with wings. Laugh at it all you want, kid. But technology's always changing. If you don't keep up with it, it'll leave your ass behind. It took six years and eight months to get that engine running. And it took us another year and a half after that to finally get the balance of the airframe just right. I'd gone from being a little girl to, well, still a girl, just older. But now, I was all alone. <sighs> Wherever the souls of my Gramps and his pals are flying, I hope it's peaceful. Then, finally, I was ready to break the sound barrier. All this plane could do was take off, accelerate, and fly up. as fighters. They were tailing something. A drone. They were going full out chasing that thing. Doing 30 G's at least. Damn, I've never seen anything move that fast. It had a rose painted on it. The Erosion emblem. But that country's a whole continent away from here. Crap. Well, it should have been my best thing to keep it junk. Should have built a return to... As of 1 p.m. today, the Kingdom of Erugia has declared war on the Ocean Federation. As soon as the news broke out, enemy aircraft began bombing Ocean territory, causing widespread destruction. The Air Defense Force has released a statement saying this violent attack was carried out by drones. They speculate the drones were secretly transported to Osea in shipping containers and launched remotely. 
The Secretary of the Navy has stated that the enemy was targeting naval ports across the country. According to the Secretary, all of the nation's aircraft carriers, including one still under construction, sustained severe damage in the attacks. We have yet to hear back from the Department as to the fate of Ocean carriers currently at sea. Hold on. I've just received breaking news. The International Space Elevator, which is being built in southern Yuzha, has been seized by the Erujian Army. Reports say former President Harling was touring the site at the time, but his current whereabouts are unknown. Our sources in government tell us it was Harling's policies regarding the space elevator that caused economic frictions in the area, and which ultimately led to this war. Located near Erujia, on the continent of Yuzha, the space elevator has been under construction for some time now. The Executive Office of the Ocean Federation has declared a national state of emergency. They have ordered all its armed forces, including Yuzhan peacekeepers, to mobilize and make the necessary preparations to launch an immediate counterattack. Ladies and gentlemen, our country is officially at war. Stay tuned for further updates. Breaking news from ENN. Osea launched an attack on the capital today, striking Farbanti from their aircraft carrier, the Kestrel II. After a brutal battle, the Erujian Air Force successfully repelled them. During the air raid, the Osean Air Force fired missiles at the city and managed to shoot down a number of Erujian fighters. Some of the disabled planes then crashed into residential areas. The world was screwed. Twenty years ago, the Earth got slammed by an asteroid. Yuja was on the wrong side of the planet and got hit. Hard. Refugees swarmed the Erujian Republic, the biggest country on the continent, plunging it into chaos. They were desperate and started a war, one they had no hope of winning. That's the war my dad fought and died in. The biggest nations from two continents went head to head, and the so-called righteous Oceans struck the deal that ended it. They fancied themselves the only nation that could bring peace and stability to the world. They even tried saving the Yuzhans, still suffering from the disaster. That's how a space elevator, stretching way up into the sky, ended up being built in Yuzha, paid for by the Oceans. President Harling said he did it out of compassion for his fellow humans. But to the folks in Erujia, it looked like Osea was moving in to take over. Erujia went from being a republic back to being a kingdom. When they started this new war, they managed to get the drop on everyone. The second the declaration hit the news, Erujian forces took control of the space elevator without spilling a single drop of blood. President Harling was touring the elevator when it happened and disappeared. Then, while that was going on, the Erujian ships that were docked all around Osea released a swarm of drone fighters they had hidden on board in containers. No one thought they were capable of doing what they did that day. With pinpoint accuracy, they managed to take out everything that was military, and not a single civilian was hurt in the process. Osea pissed lots of people off with their huge military presence around the world. Erujia didn't have the same reach, but they could hit their targets faster and cleaner. And when all this was going down, I just so happened to be in my flying drag racer. In case you were wondering, yeah, I survived. I crashed in a bombed out Ocean Air Force base, then got arrested for breaking wartime aviation laws or some crap. The world went from being at peace to being at war, all in the blink of an eye. I was tried, found guilty, and stuffed into a cargo ship. For company, I had some court-martialed soldiers. And remember those mothballed planes I told you about before? They were loaded on the ship, too. We headed off down south for several days, and then swung east. That's how I got here. 
I was thousands of kilometers from Arusia on the opposite side of the Yuzian continent. For a port, it was dull as hell. It had three rusty patrol boats. And the base? The fences were topped with razor wire, the tower had a searchlight and machine guns, and a truck with a gun turret was parked in front of the gate. Its gun was aimed at the yard. This was a prison. This place looked like a full-on base, but half the tanker trucks were just big balloons, and the runways weren't even paved, just painted on the dirt. The whole place was just one big fat lie. The only reason I was here is because they knew I'd restored a supersonic plane. They wanted me to make something out of the mothballed planes they brought, that they could park on the fake runway. Can you believe that shit? So, I tried to escape. <laughs> they found out. <laughs> and set the dogs on me. Here he comes. Mihai's looking worse. Thank God he has his granddaughters here to help him out. They're sisters, 15 and 10. Engaging the enemy in combat so we could use his physiological data to improve the drones had always taken a toll on Mihai's body. But today, he was really showing his age. The drones we based on his data were being taken down at a faster rate now compared to when the war began. When Mihai found that out, he insisted on flying to the front lines to see it for himself. Sometimes he could be so stubborn. His age wasn't the only thing affecting his health. Over the years, flying at high altitudes for prolonged stretches of time had ravaged and poisoned his body. But he was a man of grit. Today, after 28 years, he saw combat again. If his flight suit still wasn't good enough to protect him, I can't imagine how many Gs he hit today during the battle. As a pilot, he exceeds all our expectations. It's going to take a bit more tweaking before our drones can match his skill. How penal is this penal unit, you ask? This place is a shithole. If you took the stink of all the corruption in the world, then corralled it all in one place, that would give you a pretty good idea of what the air smells like around here. We got all kinds of critters, too. Everything from flea-ridden guards, rabid dogs, and a mechanic doing the stretch for life. I can't forget the rats. Yeah, we got those. And some pilots who got their wings clipped, too. One's a great pilot, but a lousy thief. One's a gambler with no luck. And one's an anarchist with no balls. Their job here was to rev the engines on the fake runways. The idea was for Arusha's spy satellite to pick up the heat sig. Even though there weren't any real fighters here, it looked like it on their infrared. I bet you're wondering, if Arugia lost the war, how come they still have a spy satellite? Because someone over there was smart enough to train a bunch of computer nerds to hack into half of Osea's satellites. That's how come. Every now and again, I'd try to bust out. And every single time, those damn dogs would drag me right back. When I was in my cell, I'd hear this voice coming from the guards' room. It was the Erusian princess rallying her people on the Erusian national broadcast. All us prisoners had become big fans of hers. You want to hear something funny? The guards were big fans, too. I swear to God, every time she was on the air, they'd turn up the volume on the radio and sit there listening. I could see how someone like her could win the hearts and minds of soldiers and workers alike. When the princess said something, you could tell she meant every word. Lately, she'd been having more fun with her speeches, and that made her seem even more charming. You could say her charm was like a virus. Whenever she'd point out stuff that was wrong with Osea, the prisoners in here went nuts. Hell, if anyone knew how messed up Osea was, it was the prisoners. They'd shout, burn Osea down. 
No way am I just gonna sit here and rot away in this hellhole. Dark blue. Instead of building fake-ass planes to trick Arusia, I'm gonna build one that'll really take off. You can count on that. All UAVs have been splashed. All aircraft, former President Harling's transport is ready to take off. Mother Goose One, take off. Let's wait till we're home safe. Mage Squadron, Mother Goose One is heading south. Provide support. Five minutes remaining. Skykeeper, bogeys on my radar. Bearing 220. Mage Two, clear out the bogeys near Mother Goose One. Protect Mother Goose One. Destroy the Mage 2! Mage 2! Oh my god. Mother Goose 1 has been shot down. Where'd the missile come from? Mage 2 fired that. There was no A friendly missile hit him. Verifying the situation. Stop speculating. Friendly fire! I saw it! Mother Goose 1 exploded in air. No one could have survived. Looks like it tried to protect the elevator. Arusian bastards, they just killed a hero! Mage 1, it's a trigger. <sighs> trigger was the closest. UAVs were crawling all over our objective. I told you to keep a goddamn eye on the hatchling. It must have been a mistake. Arsenal Bird is entering. All aircraft withdraw immediately. Bad news for us here at the prison. The enemy fell for our decoy base. With all the fake planes and trucks we had out, it must have looked to them like the Ocean Air Force was about to go on the attack. Day after day after day after day they bombed us. Osea didn't give a damn. We weren't soldiers to them, so go ahead. Bomb us. In their eyes we were expendable. Worth less than the fake planes in the bunkers. No biggie. While I made fake planes, they had me put together some working ones. Then, some genius at HQ decided we should send it up, so the base looked legit. Thankfully, we had people to crew them. It didn't matter what we were locked up here for anymore. Top brass needed pilots, and criminals were all they had. A crook, a gambler, an anarchist. Just your typical lowlifes. They threw each one of them in a cockpit and sent them up to intercept the enemy's planes. But in the end, it was all just for show. So, up they went, day after day after day. Today they tossed someone new into the mix. Wonder what he did to get sent here. My dad died flying for the Ocean Air Force. When your allies are surrounded, one of the most dangerous missions is giving them cover to retreat. Whoever signed up for that was a real hero. But even more dangerous than that was being the one who had to cover the rear guard's retreat. That was my dad's job, and one time, he called it off. Said it was too late for him. Said anyone else would have done the same. I found that out from a war buddy of his when he came to tell me how my dad died. The next time a retreat happened, my dad volunteered to be in the rear guard. Dumbass. He died all right. No one came to help. The news nearly broke me. Of all the ways to get killed, that's gotta be the most pathetic one ever. Am I right? There's a rumor going around about another inmate. A guy they brought here a little while ago. Get this, talk in the cell block says he was sent here because he killed Harling. The president of Osea during the last war, remember? He's the one that sent my dad on that suicide mission. He's the reason I had to go live with my grandpa. 
and why me and Gramps started building a supersonic jet. He's the reason I ended up here. Maybe I should give that guy a thank you note for killing him. Nah. God, I hate the smell of this place. It's all fake and lies and bullshit. It reeks. Mihai's granddaughters like to keep to themselves, mostly. They were well-behaved and possessed a sort of quiet elegance. From time to time, I'd catch myself looking at them, wondering what they were talking about. I'm sure everyone on the base did the same. They were such enthralling creatures. Every night, a crowd would gather around Mihai. They were the men tasked with guarding him in the air. Their jackets all bore the same patch, a relic from a nation that was long gone. Decades ago, during the Age of Expansion, the Kingdom of Erugia absorbed many countries. Theirs was one of them. Mihai asked them, Yet what is a nation? Can we actually see the physical lines that divide one from another? People of my generation can no longer speak the language of our homeland. My grandparents always look sad when they see I have no idea what they're saying to me. Mihai didn't say a word after that. His scarred face betrayed no emotion. He didn't get those scars from flying, though. Mihai was originally from Shilaji. His real name is Mihai Dimitru Margarita Cornelio Leopold Blanca Carol Aon Ignatius Raphael Maria Nikitas A. Shilaji. When he was young, he was the heir to the Grand Duchy of Shilaji. Then, revolution broke out among his people. Mihai was betrayed by a close friend who pointed a gun at his face and pulled the trigger. The revolution was successful, but the new country that sprang from it was annexed by the expanding kingdom of Arusia. The Arusian royal family allowed Mihai's family to retain their title and noble standing in the new kingdom. But Mihai surprised them all by signing up for the draft like an ordinary Arusian citizen. He was then accepted into the Air Force Academy by order of the king. Mihai soon became an ace pilot when the royal family was ousted and Arugia became a republic, he continued his service for the new regime. Test sites soon flourished. One day, a classmate of Mihai's granddaughter visited. I noticed the rose emblem. She laughed like a princess. And I found out later, she was indeed the daughter of Arugia's new ruler. She was the connection to the royal bloodline everyone was looking for, the one to restore the monarchy. This new princess was truly a godsend for the Arugian people. If Mihai's granddaughters were like the moon, she was like the sun, around which everything seemed to orbit. Her face was so expressive, it's no wonder the people of this war-torn country instantly felt at ease when they saw her speeches. They started singing. The pilots of the support plane smiled, even though they wished their nation were independent from hers. Angelic. I wonder how Mihai felt about all of this. It was my job to research his neurological data, after all. I wish I could figure him out. Whatever his feelings were about losing his homeland, he kept hidden, even from me. The crew said the enemy had one mean son of a bitch flying for him. Our team had a few Air Force hot dogs, real experienced pilots. But this guy swooped in like a hawk, locked on, and took them all out in the blink of an eye. Reminds me of a story Gramps told me once. He said a little while before he retired from active duty, he saw an enemy fighter wipe out an entire formation right in front of him. 
It was like seeing how a shark works when it's going after its dinner. This enemy pilot stalked Gramps' pals from below, just like how a shark would. Then one by one, he put the bite on them. Sounds like what happened to our guys today. Kind of surprised so many made it back alive. I bet when they saw what was going on, they broke formation and left their buddies to the shark. Hang on. There's three extra planes here. They're foreigners too. I had a chance to talk to one of the pilots that escaped back here, so I took it. Apparently, two of our planes took the enemy on alone. They covered the Allies so they could retreat. The hell kind of idiot does a thing like that? The last pilot to land back at the base was that scrawny anarchist dude. He always had this dumb grin on his face, like he didn't give a damn about whatever he did to get thrown in here with the rest of us. Was he the one who went gung-ho? I bought him a drink later. After the usual small talk, I turned the topic around to the mission. For an anarchist, he struck me as a bit weird. Nothing like what I expected. He talked a mile a minute and kept going on and on about library books. Not encyclopedias, those cheesy adventure novels you read in high school. Nothing against those. I like a good story myself once in a while. But I wasn't here to talk books. Uh, I remember that day well. Amidst the swirling clouds, a fighter squadron was trying to help its allies reach safety. He's pretty foolish, isn't he? I thought so too. Suddenly, a highly skilled enemy fighter squadron appeared and began picking them off at the edges. One by one, they fell right out of the sky. Although, I guess there was nobody around that was even more foolish to go to their aid then. So you simply watch things unfold from a distance. Yeah. I mean, who would have ever thought that I'd just go and follow him straight into the enemy squadron like that? After what felt like decades, I finally got to the info I was looking for. He wasn't the guy. He said he was just following his wingman's lead and managed not to die somehow. The hero on this mission was the new guy. The one that killed Harling. <laughs> How did you feel? I'm still kind of shaken up, actually. But you know, I do feel a certain sense of pride, too. He really is foolish, isn't he? Yep, he sure is. I went to the hangar to have myself a closer look at Trigger's plane. I knew that burnt smell. That's what happens when an engine's been driven to its limit. This pilot was a hot dog. From now on, I was gonna keep my eye on this idiot. From a distance, though. I didn't want to get too tight with someone who was a better pilot than my dad. Even so, I decided to give this guy's plane a little bit of the old Avril magic touch. He needed all the help he could get. Suddenly, we were being treated like a regular unit. We've been ordered to pack everything up and move the base further inland. We even got a transport plane. The funny thing is, no one here remembers I've got a bum leg and, oh, that I'm not a soldier. Take a look at the map. There's an island on the other side of Yuja our Marines landed on. The space elevator's not too far from there. They tell us the airfield's being used as a base to support the elevator. Not sure if I trust that intel. Anyway, the transport plane's gonna drop us there. Without any fighters to cover us. Some genius thought we could commandeer the enemy's jets they left in the hangars, and use those to fight. Y'all aren't real soldiers, they said. Any other day we'd be using you lowlifes to go out and dig up landmines. And prisoners don't get guns. You'll just have to make do with whatever we give you and like it. A 
phone. They don't let us prisoners near them. But with all the hustle and bustle of moving the base, they forgot to lock this one up. Looks like an antique. I lost my right for a phone call ever since I was arrested and locked up. It's trippy to think that I can just hook it up, dial a number, and talk to someone from my own country. Planning escapes ain't all I'm good at. I'm plenty good at remembering phone numbers, too. A little while later, I headed over to HQ. You must know. We did get a call direct from command. That pipe, what exactly are you doing with it? My grandfather had a lot of friends in the Air Force from his time as a lieutenant. My point? Well, you're going to set out in your own special aircraft. Then you'll send everybody else off in the wrong direction while you head somewhere else. <sighs> All right, fine. But just you and you alone. You're the only one allowed on board. Besides, there's only one seat left. I said, cool. That's exactly what I wanted to hear. 